Hey guys, so today I wanted to take a few minutes and go over some of my camera gear. I've pretty much used the same system for the last 10 years, maybe. Just with a little bit of little bit of changes here and there, little tweaks on lenses. And then the cameras, I've pretty much, since I found the Panasonic, uh, the Lumix GH series, I've kind of stuck with that. I started with the GH4, now shooting on a GH5, may upgrade to a GH6 but they've also got the S2 that has a lot better autofocus capability. If you're just a cameraman or if you're just filming, you know, manual focus is where you want to be. As a self-documenter and as a self-filmer, it's really handy to be able to have some of that autofocus. Just kind of go over the basics of what I have, whether it's what I'm taking with me up on the mountain for an extended trip or, you know, some, some other truck hunting or whitetail hunting or that type of hunting scenario. So basically we'll start off with the camera. This is the GH4, it's the one's rattle canned. I'm actually filming with my GH5, but it's a micro two thirds. I've really liked this camera because they are very durable. They're small, they're lightweight, they're compact. They're easy to pack in and pack with. And, you know, just a very user-friendly, simple camera to use. As far as I'm concerned, for a self-filmer, self-documenter, and an actual video quality camera, it's pretty dang hard to beat the GH5. I love the picture quality. Um, I know the camera really well, and it's a very simple, user-free camera. I've done some filming with the Sony cameras, and, um, you know, I'm kind of an ox anyway, but it seemed to really clumsy to me and I kept hitting buttons that I didn't know how to get out of menus in different scenarios and so it was really frustrating with this the buttons are really kind of hard to hit anything that's going to mess you up as far as the lens goes I use pretty much two lenses all the time exclusively so I'll use this 12 to 35 this is a native lens native lumix lens Fairly wide angle at that 12, uh, you know, 12 millimeter, and then the 35 gives me a little bit of zoom if I want to do some some tighter focus on, you know, anything that's in kind of a close range. So this is really just kind of my interview interview style lens. The lens that I have on here is a 12 by 60, and sometimes I'll pack that if I really feel like I want to have a little more magnification for for certain things, but I, this is really kind of my favorite lens with that. The other lens that I use, this is a 100 to 400, it's an F4. And I, I'm not a big spec guy, but for me, this gives me really good quality and enables me to zoom out there as far as I need to do. I also can film, you know, a whitetail hunt, several of the whitetail hunts, because you back off to that 100 millimeter and it's plenty for a 15, 20 yard shot out of the tree stand. It gives me a nice clear, but if something's clear, clear uh, picture, but if something's coming from a distance, I can zoom in there and, and really grab it. So. These GHs, they're not the best with, for photos. Um, they're good, but they're not the greatest. So I think that's what maybe steers a lot of guys towards a Canon or a Sony, is they want to have the, the higher photo capabilities. I'm pretty much 90% a video shooter, but uh, some of that's kind of changing as, as I'm getting a little more interest in the photos and a little more demand from, from some partners on photos. So uh, the audio that I use, Pretty deliberate when, I, when I'm when i filming a hunt. I'm pretty much if I'm gonna be talking, I'm talking to the camera and it's in a situation where I feel like I can talk to the camera. So I pretty much just use an onboard mic. It works well. This is a Sennheiser MKE 400. I think this is a Gen 2. I've gone through a, several of them. Um, this one seems a little bit more robust. Great audio audio quality. I will say anytime you're patching audio into a DSLR or into this camera specifically, you're gonna get a little bit of distortion. When I do use a lapel mic, I mean, generally I haul the Sennheisers. Um, there's a receiver and a lapel mic. Really for me, it's just kind of a pain in the butt to always either keep them on all the time and have the batteries run dead or turn them on, remember to turn it on when I'm talking to the camera. So um, I really don't do lapel mics much anymore, although Remy turned me on to this Task Cam, which is what I'm using now. And it's essentially just an audio recorder that records separately. So it's a lot more, a lot lighter. There's one or two batteries in here, I can't remember, um, versus the four that you gotta have there with the receiver. So from a pack-in, you know, backcountry hunt type of a, of a standpoint, this little Task Cam, you know, just personal recorder works really well. What I don't like about it is when I'm recording video, obviously your audio is being recorded here, the video is recorded separate. So I really have to keep track of telling myself and logging when I'm on camera, when I'm using this mic so that I can match those, those audio tracks up later. 
the editing system, the Adobe Premiere, is really good about linking those audio tracks and searching for that for you. But if I'm filming all day for three or four days and I'm piecing in audio here occasionally, um, it's really kind of hard to find those pieces three days into it to find the audio that I used with this and the video. It just takes adds a little bit more time into the editing process, but ultimately I think that it gives a lot better audio quality, which is not something I've focused very well on in the past. Um, and I always tell myself I want to be better at it. And I probably will try to work harder on it, um, but it is kind of a hassle. So, But really, from my filming style, I only need audio if I'm looking at the camera and talking to the camera, unless it's you know a natural sound or a, I want some, some wildlife footage, whether it's an elk bugling or just the wind and that type of thing, then that's when that onboard will come in really handy. So I think it's more just a matter of getting in the habit of saying, you know, looking at the recorder and saying, oh, this is audio track 17, boom. And then it's that'll it'll make my editing process a lot easier. Um, tripod, I've had this get so for probably 15 years. This is the original one of the original mountaineering um, styles. I, I can't even remember the number on it. I've had to glue the legs back in a couple of times. What I like about this is just is its its length is really good without having a lot of bulk. Um, folds out quick. It's just really robust. It's worked really well for me. I'll try to write down some numbers in the blog post there or whatever, but um, you can't even really find this head anymore or this tripod. They're named different and have different numbers, and then the head is a little bit different. It's actually, I guess there's a couple of different heads. This is one that I have on my camera arm, but really lightweight. Um, I did film with a Vortex tripod quite a bit. I liked their little pin head. I can't even remember what they call it, but I found for filming I needed something a little more fluid a little more smooth and so I kind of just stick with this ultralight um, get so head it's a it's a one ball I don't even know what they call it but anyway really easy really simple to use um, so use head and this whole system here this is well under three pounds with the tripod and the and the head it's a two stage three leg what is that one two three three leg three-leg setup right there. Um, I used to, and I really liked it, for years I would put, I had a broken shooting stick and I mounted it off the back here about this long and I'd mount my GoPro off of the, the back of that. And then I'd have, of course, my camera on here. And I loved, I loved that angle. I loved giving, being able to give that perspective of filming a hunt, you know, and actually filming the filming. It was really cool, but I've kind of, not 100% gone away from the GoPros or the point of view cameras, but the problem that I've had, and especially with hunting a lot on public land, is it just shows everything, you know? So it really kind of botched uh, some of my hunting areas, um, some of my friends' hunting areas. It really just kind of messed a lot of things up by just having such a wide angle of view and just showing everything. And so I've really been careful on when I use a GoPro and when I show it. So for that reason, I kind of took it away from filming the camera because you could see every mountain range, every peak, and, and really triangulate and find out exactly where I'm at. And here's the, the reality is I'm hunting crappy areas. It's not like I'm hunting the best areas in any given state, but I'm hunting mostly public land. And so, um, you know, for a lot of new people getting into hunting, they're really kind of allowed them to hit the easy button and fast track into a, an area or location that I maybe have scouted for years and figured out and it just was showing too much so for selfish reasons I kind of got away from the GoPro a little bit or the point of view cameras and you know mostly it's it's been GoPro they are kind of glitchy you know from time to time this is the, the Hero 9 I think or the whatever the 9 model is and the batteries have never been that great. Just the point of view cameras really have really never been that phenomenal. So I try to do as much as I can on on my my main camera. The other camera that I use, everybody has them. Cell phone. I use my cell phone a lot. If you if you were to watch my dull sheep hunt in Alaska, uh, a big percentage of that was my cell phone because it's always in my pocket. And when something's going down, it's really easy to pop that out. Um, so don't discount your, your mobile phone and being able to film. Um, that's when I'll tie it into my 
phone scope, through my spot and scope. So a lot of the long distance footage that you see is filmed just like this, through the phone scope, through my spotting scope, and then, you know, 1,000, 2,000 yards away, which doesn't give you the highest, highest quality of, of footage, but, uh, you know, 2,000 yards or long distances, you're not gonna be able to see a whole heck of a lot anyway. And then as things kinda, as we, as I kind of approach and get into to closer on the animal and tighter filming, then, you know, obviously the 400 millimeter is, is plenty there. So this is just a little bag that I keep extra batteries in. Um, I keep a chamois for cleaning the lens and then just a really inexpensive waterproof bag. That's it. And then I usually keep a couple of uh, AAA batteries in here for my headlamp and for my microphone. This runs on a AAA and then the Tascam also runs on a AAA battery. So I just can't kind of keep that in there. Depending on how long I'm going out on a hunt will determine how many batteries that I take with me. I generally try to budget a battery per day. These cameras, especially the GH4, is phenomenal on battery life. The GH5 is a little bit less, but the, the more I've gotten into my filming career, the more I edit with the camera, and the more I'm only really filming what I want to film. Um, that is the other really enticing feature about the S5 II, Mark II, whatever they call it, the Panasonic, is you can actually tie in through USB-C. I can plug in my dark energy or a portable charger into that and actually run the camera off of a portable charger. So that'll come in real handy. But ultimately, I kind of got away from hauling in solar chargers and all that kind of thing and just went to just pack in a few extra batteries less space and less weight. But for me, I generally budget a one battery per day. Unless I'm on a 10 or a 12 day hunt, then I kind of say, all right, I'm gonna have some downtime. I'm gonna scale that back to maybe six or eight batteries um, just to save on, on extra weight and extra bulk. Um, and then, you know, but the downside to that is if I'm not running my camera as often like for time lapses time lapses just suck a lot of battery out of the camera but the productions kind of suffer from it you don't get a lot of that you know nice cinematic appeal to it and that's one thing that early in my filming and in documenting hunts and i i was going balls to the walls and just doing everything and there was so many time lapses and you know different different uh cinematic shots and cutaways and everything and just, just burning through it. But the more I just wanted to simplify my life and simplify my hunts and make it a little bit more enjoyable, I kind of took away a lot of those aspects of the filming because it was really taking away from the hunting part of it. You know, all the, the time lapses were shot during the middle of the day or whatever when nothing was going on. But the more I get into hunt mode, it's like there's always something going on. I'm never just sitting around doing nothing. I want to be somewhere. I want to do something. Or I'm in a situation where I set up and start a time lapse, and I was like, oh, elk pops out. I need to film this elk. And so it just really kind of kind of went away. I do want to focus on that a little bit more. Um, really, the ultimate solution would be to pack two cameras, and then you just set one up that's just strictly for that. I don't know if that's going to happen, but the goal is is to try to be, to be to go back to some of those earlier days and be a little bit more cinematic and a little more producing rather than just documenting. Um, so that's pretty much there with my mountain system. I mean, this is really pretty much what's going on the mountain with me right here. All together with the spotting scope, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 pounds. It's really kind of a pain in the ass, but that's that's what we do. That's how we do it. When I whitetail hunt, I keep it simple. I've been using just this fourth arrow camera arm. I have several camera arms. I have a muddy. I have a third arm. I like them all. Um, I went to this one just I like the ball head it can really adjust to different angles of the tree it's light compact and fits well I think they've got new models since I've picked this one up that are probably better but I'm kind of a creature of habit and pretty much a tight wad so it's not like I'm just gonna get rid of this camera arm and and buy the newest one um, you know maybe I'll give this to somebody or some of my guys or something and, and pick up another another camera arm but that one's worked really well so as far as a drone goes, I used to do quite a bit of drone stuff, you know, down low in that, but ultimately it became a point where some of the Forest Service or BLM weren't allowing film permits for a drone and you had to have special licensing. And so anymore, I'm just like, uh, 
I'll use my drone if I'm on private land or if I, you know, really feel like it's going to add to that situation. Otherwise, I just kind of look for other opportunities to film aerial. Like in Alaska, you're in a Super Cub or in some areas, maybe you're in a helicopter and you can get some of those cinematic shots. That's what I'm using now. That's what I've used over basically over the last 10 years is pretty much nothing different than what you see there. Um, when I'm truck hunting or... You know, whatever, I have kind of an art lens that just gives me a little bit tighter of depth and give me really shallow depth of field on different things. A couple other little trinkets that I'll use from time to time, but it's very, very rare. So what will I do different in the future? I'm probably going to do less point of view, less GoPro, um, other than maybe in those scenarios where the only way I'm gonna get that shot on film is to have a point of view and it'll all be by a case-by-case -case basis. It's not gonna be when I'm up on the, the, the ridge line and I've got my elk walking underneath me and I'm showing the entire valley floor. It ain't gonna be in that situation. But um, you know, there may be a time to time where I'll use a point of view camera. Um, I'm probably gonna switch from the GH5 to that S2. That's really kind of where I'm leaning towards right now. But it is a full frame camera versus a two thirds uh, micro or whatever they call it, micro two thirds. Uh, again, I'm not a technical guy, so I have to change out my lenses too. Pretty much where I run just two lenses, it's not that big of a deal because I can still utilize my same audio. Uh, I think it even uses the same batteries. I can't can't be certain, but that's not a huge expense. So you know, it's going to be into it. You know, several thousand dollars to change camera setups, but I feel like for me moving forward and for what I want to try to accomplish and to be get back to being better at what I do on the filming side of things and not compromise the the hunting that I've been able to do, uh, I think I'm going to go to that that uh, different style of camera. Same style, just a different camera is basically all it's going to be. So. If you have any questions, go ahead and fire me an email, admin at, uh, oh, that's going to swamp my guys. Yeah, you just have to contact us through the website or something because I'm not, uh, not going to swamp them and I don't want to give out my personal email. But get on the website, uh, shoot us a contact or comment below. I probably won't read it if it's in the comments just because I don't read the comments anymore. So you're probably going to have to send me an email if you're really serious about asking a question or giving some suggestions or any of that type of thing. So look for this and more videos, tutorials to come, maybe, unless I run out of time or decide that I don't want to do it.